Hi, I'm Mars Europe, and this is the James Webb Space Telescope. We're here at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where they're piecing together a space telescope so powerful it can see planets in other solar systems and even witness the first galaxies being formed. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. It will tell us more about the cosmos than any other space telescope before. You know, it's so large it couldn't fit into a rocket, so they folded it up like an origami bird and will deploy in a complex unraveling that will take two weeks to complete. So we're all used to how telescopes look. I mean, even the Hubble Space Telescope looks how you would imagine one to look like. But the James Webb, well, it looks like they took a deflective dish out of the Starship Enterprise and they put it on a sandwich. The primary mirror consists of 18 gold-plated beryllium mirrors with actuators underneath so it can form a perfectly curved mirror once deployed. But what really makes this telescope different is that it can peer into the atmospheres of alien worlds, telling us what they're made out of and if they harbor life. But let's have a real scientist tell us more about that. So the James Webb Space Telescope is the largest space telescope that has ever been built and launched into space. Um, and that's really exciting. It's very different from Hubble. It's much l larger than Hubble is. Um, and it operates at a different wavelength. So it operates in the infrared, which means that we can look at different things in the universe and see different uh, molecules in the atmospheres of planets. Essentially, James Webb is an infrared camera. But why not just make a bigger version of the Hubble? Why study in the infrared? Well, it turns out there's a lot of things in deep space that can only be detected with the infrared. The infrared gives us lots of different molecules in the universe. So with the Hubble Space Telescope, we're currently looking in the optical uh, and we're looking in the near infrared. So we can see things like water absorption features. We can see um, hydrogen scattering and lots of different things like that. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're going to be looking into the infrared where we start to see the influence of carbon-based molecules. We can look for CO2. We can look for methane in the early universe and we can look for all of these things in planetary atmospheres as well. And we do this by looking for the starlight that shone through the atmosphere before it reaches the telescope. So as a planet passes in front of the star, some of that starlight filters through the atmosphere. And each molecule has a unique fingerprint. We're looking for an imbalance in those molecules because life itself causes imbalance in our atmosphere. We know that from our own atmosphere. There's an enhanced amount of methane which is caused by life. So we're looking for an imbalance of methane to other materials like carbon dioxide that would tell us that there's something on the planet generating that methane compared to what we would expect there to be. Molecules in planetary atmospheres are only part of the reason why the infrared is useful for James Webb's mission. The infrared can cut through the stellar dust to see the birth of stars and planetary disks within nebulas. Now one of the reasons why exploring the infrared is so necessary actually starts with the Hubble. One of its most important images was the deep field. In this image are 10,000 galaxies stretching back billions of years until Hubble could see no more. Hubble didn't simply run out of galaxies. There's actually a limit to how far back it could see. Light from beyond this period is stretched so much by the expansion of the universe that it becomes red shifted, meaning it can only be seen deep in the infrared, which Hubble cannot do. So the, the Hubble Deep Field image is the furthest back that we have seen galaxies in our universe. Uh, James Webb's going to look even further back to the earliest galaxies that ever formed. And the importance of that is we're trying to really understand the structure of those. There's so many questions that we don't have answers to. How and why did galaxies in the early universe form the way that they did? Um, why are they different from ones that we're seeing now, like our own galaxy? The structure is so uh, distinct in our n newer galaxies, but old galaxies are more like clusters and they're more like little puffballs that are joined together. And we're trying to really understand how those galaxies formed and whether or not the earliest galaxies we've seen from the Hubble Deep Field are the same as the earliest galaxies that could have formed in our universe after the Big Bang. So James Webb's going to be looking at those ones and that gives us three different steps throughout our universe that we're able to compare to each other and work out what, what is happening and how and why. Now, this will undoubtedly be some of the best observations of the early universe and of other planets we've ever had. But this launch won't be a simple one. Since James Webb records in the infrared, it can't be as close to Earth as Hubble is. Now, Hubble is just 300 miles above Earth, 
At that distance, it will be like trying to listen to Mozart during an air raid. The James Webb needs to operate without interference from the sun, the moon, the earth, and even its own instruments. We need to send this thing 1 million miles away to a spot called L2. That's four times the distance the earth is to the moon, and even then, we'll need to shield it from the sun. The James Webb Space Telescope needs to be really cold, and that's why we have this tennis court sized sun shield that protects the telescope, the mirrors, and the instruments from the light and heat of the Earth, Sun, and Moon. And it's made of a material called captain. It's very, very thin, but you can see how flimsy it is. If you imagine five tennis court sized pieces having to fold up to fit in a rocket, it has to be very, very thin. But don't let this deceive you because the stuff is, actually has amazing thermal properties. So five layers of this is enough to, you could almost boil water on the hot side of the spacecraft and you could actually freeze nitrogen on the cold side of the spacecraft. Since James Webb will be experiencing extreme operating conditions, NASA has to test if these instruments will work once it's out there. Remember, it's literally going a million miles away. So there's no repair missions, no turning back. If something goes wrong out there, that's goodbye to all that science and the $8 billion and over 20 years it took to make it. To do this, NASA needs to simulate an actual launch and recreate what it's like in space here on Earth. Right, so it was really assembled here at Goddard, that is the telescope part, the mirrors, the instruments, um, and then we also did the environmental testing, shaking it, blasting sound at it. Um, we actually need to do more cold tests on it because uh, it's going to work at very, very cold temperatures. We don't actually have a chamber big enough to test the whole telescope here. So um, at NASA Johnson, we actually have a really large thermal vacuum chamber called Chamber A. They used it for Apollo and also a Transformers movie. Uh, so we're actually just about to pack this up and send it to NASA Johnson so we can deploy it and do an end-to-end -end test of the actual telescope. Chamber A at Johnson Space Center is a National Historic Landmark. Like really, the historical significance of its role in a space exploration has earned it that title. Nowhere else on Earth comes close to recreating what it's like in the cold vacuum of space in here. But doing these tests won't come without risks. So the chamber in itself can go cold very quickly, but that will introduce lots of dangerous gradients. You don't want to cool it so fast that some parts get much cooler or warmer than others. And then we have a big team of thermal engineers that are watching multiple sensors on the whole mirrors and the instruments to make sure nothing gets out of range with everything else to get there. And finally, they're going through each part of the telescope with a fine tooth comb the size of atoms. For example, just listen to this. We test it and we can find little mountains on that mirror, okay? And we can measure those mountains to about 10 nanometers, okay? So if you took that entire mirror and you made it the size of the entire United States, we could measure the height of a mountain to the accuracy of a quarter. So after all this, after all the testing in Houston, James Webb will be sent to California to be mated with its sunshield by Northrop Grumman. Then it will be shipped to French Guiana where finally it will be put aboard an Ariane 5 rocket built by the European Space Agency. It's set to launch in October of 2018 with all of our hopes and dreams of what could be found in the vastness of space and time. I've been Mars Europe, and this is the James Webb Space Telescope. For more information on the James Webb Space Telescope, follow their mission on Twitter or visit their site in the link below.